Final Fantasy. Just let that name sink in a little. Final Fantasy. Final. As in last, concluding, end. Strange then that the first release was in 1987 and here we are 30 years later in the middle of number 15. Except it's not even the 15th game is it? Alongside the numbered entries there are also various sequels, prequels, spin-offs, side stories and more to boot. I mean how many parts are there to the Fabula Nova Crystallis saga or the Final Fantasy 7 story? Even 4 had a sequel in the after years. Good job there wasn't a prequel. The before years? Mm. Anyway, within that 30 year time frame, there have been some truly wonderful games. Like... 13! You know, the one that was so good we got a sequel. And then another sequel. Yay! Thankfully though, there have been some really, really stellar entries in the Final Fantasy universe. But unfortunately, there have been some downright stinkers too. So, with the release of Episode Prompto, bringing Final Fantasy XV back to the forefront and into our minds, let's have a look at the 5 worst and 5 best games in the Final Fantasy saga, starting with the 5 worst. Number 5, Final Fantasy X-2. This game was such a shame. Granted, X wasn't exactly a classic and... Ah, uh, Blitzball! But it didn't deserve this childish, awful sequel. What's more, it didn't even really need it. Yes, X ended on a bit of a cliffhanger, wondering what happened to Titus, but that was a nice way to end it. Sometimes in life, things aren't all tied up with a neat little bow. Sometimes we are left to wonder. And sometimes, like here, we get the gull wings. Or as LeBronc aptly called them, the dull wings. What is with the main cast? Creating a game where all the playable characters are female sounds great on paper. Power to the women! Until you see what they are wearing, or in a lot of cases, not wearing. Clearly the characters were designed by middle-aged men and these girls are all under 20. Riku is just 17 for God's sake. Why is her default costume a bikini? Now I like the job system that Final Fantasy uses and changing them mid-battle makes them even more versatile. But why, oh why, do they change based on clothing? You have to believe that once the all-female party with the ability to change jobs was decided on, developers just thought, women like clothes, right? Let's dress them all up in pretty clothes. Yes, and once you've done that, why not make them hang their new clothes on a washing line? Or do the washing up? Or go the whole hog, marry a successful man, have a couple of children, quit work, become a housewife, making sure the house is clean at all times and that dinner is on the table ready and waiting for their husbands to get in after a hard day at the office. Ah! Number 4. Lightning Returns Final Fantasy XIII What a stupid concept for a game. With only 5 maps, you have a limited amount of places to explore. But that's okay, because you only have 13 days to the end of the world anyway, and you don't even have a full 24 hours per day for some reason. While this is an interesting concept, the reality of the clock continuously counting down each day means you have no opportunity to take in some sites, collect items or try out the side quests. Not that that's really an option anyway, as there are so many things you can only do at certain times of the day or on certain days. The problem is this leads to so much backtracking or waiting that you need to fully map out exactly what you intend to do on each day before you start. So this makes the first playthrough nearly impossible without a guidebook. It kills exploration and investigation that the fans of the series are so used to. After 13's poor start, 13-2 did a very good job in restoring some faith in the series, and it's such a shame that all that hard work gets undone here by the third instalment. Number 3, Final Fantasy 8. In fairness to 8, following 7 was never going to be easy, and going for a more realistic take on the overall look and style of the game seemed good in theory. It could have been the fantasy based on reality that 15 would become, but there were just too many flaws. For starts, 
all the characters were two-dimensional, leaving fans unable to really invest in them. Irvin and Zell are just jerks. Quistis and Selfie just merge into the background. As for Squall and Renoa, their relationship, if we can even call it that, is just so forced. By the time they have their moment in the Ragnarok spaceship, you just don't care about them. Plus, it sort of comes out of nowhere because she's only just regained consciousness and after constantly pushing Squall away, she just throws herself at him. It's too weird, and the less said about Laguna and Co, the better. Also, Square changed far too much from their previous games, and although the junction system seemed like a nice way to refresh the system, it just doesn't work. After not really explaining it that well, you have to figure it out, but the problem is once you do that, you find that you could advance everyone's stats so much that there are no real threats at all left in the game. Sure, you might be level 9, but you can be playing like a level 20 plus with the right magic junctioned. It's far too easy and renders the levelling up process irrelevant. Number 2, Final Fantasy 13. It doesn't make the top spot! Shock! What makes a classic Final Fantasy game? Interesting and engaging characters with clear motivations and drives, a vast game world you can explore to your heart's content, side quests are plenty, well, 13 gives you none of that. Let's start with a cast. Lightning, or Light for some reason, is just a typical brooding emo teenager. Sure, she has a cool sword and can summon Odin, but these have been seen in the series so many times before and shouldn't be her memorable features. On that note, when did Odin become lightning based? No square, it's just wrong. Alongside her are other equally boring characters that just don't develop at all. I'm looking at you, Snow. And they go against a big bad in Bartandalus with motivation so convoluted you wish they didn't even try to justify it. The writers clearly confused themselves halfway through and had to write themselves out of a corner. Finally, the mainly linear game design is just horrible. Walk along a path, trigger a cutscene. Walk along another path, trigger a boss battle. Walk along yet another path, Trigger a gun to your own head, if only. Yes, the world looks beautiful, but there's no chance to really get lost in it until right near the end of the game. And even then, all you can really do is just kill monsters in a very, very specific order. And surprise, surprise, that order makes you backtrack so much you feel like you've reversed down all those corridors back to the beginning of the sodding game. And number one, Final Fantasy fourteen. Can you say broken? How the hell did this game get to shelves? How? Let me be clear. I'm not referring to A Realm Reborn. That was a complete rebuild of this utter car crash of an entry. But the original release was so bad, Square actually shut down the servers and rebuilt the entire game from scratch. A wise move in the end, but how was this game allowed to ship in that condition? Do they not test their games? It seems not. The development team made sure the game looked pretty, but didn't consider properly how this would affect the gameplay. How does a flower pot need as many polygons and lines of shader code put into it as the player character? That is just madness. Unless you were thinking of spending hours upon hours looking at said flower pot. And if you are, it might be cheaper to just, you know, buy an actual flower pot. Do you know how the development team planned on solving their broken game? By launching patches. Yes, because why build the game properly in the first place when you can sort of fix it afterwards? That'll endear you to fans of the series, fans that have funneled millions of yen, dollars and pounds into your company. Thankfully Square did the right thing in the end, but it's still baffling how anyone in charge let it get to that point in the first place. Just do it right first time. Yes, 15 has taken 10 years to make it to the market, but surely that's better than shipping it broken so it can get to the shelves quicker. Or maybe that's just me. And now on to the five best games. Number five, Dissidia. This is certainly a more casual game compared to the main series. Due to a lack of world map and exploration, there isn't really much in the way of side questing, one of the fundamental elements of any Final Fantasy game. However, the expansion on the main heroes and villains background 
and the way they all seamlessly intertwine along with a more interactive battle system gives it a charm all its own. The story of this entry, although pretty straightforward, fits in with the mythos perfectly and gives each character, especially the heroes, their own clear path and motivation whilst building on their already established background. It was also an introduction for many to some characters of the older games of the series, anything originally pre-PlayStation. And if that's not enough, you get to control the bad guys too, and that is every gamer's dream. Yeah, we all like saving the world, but we love wreaking havoc even more. What better way to do that than by using greats such as Garland, Golbez and Sephiroth to carry it out. Number 4, Final Fantasy IX. This is possibly more of a subjective choice from me for this one, as it seems to get overlooked almost immediately, and still does really. But there is so much charm and character to this truly great game, and it is wonderful homage to a bygone era. Because of a lack of exposure, especially in Europe, to the older games, this was probably most people's first experience to some truly Final Fantasy-esque things. Things like the medieval backdrop, uh, fixed jobs for the characters, and having more than three party members in battle. Nine pays tribute to these elements and many more so beautifully and at the same time still feels like a legitimately new entry into the series and not just an echo of the older games it's referencing. All of the characters feel fresh and new and not just rehashes. The world is rich and diverse and fully accessible at a fairly early point, especially if you make use of Choco and level him up. Not only that, but the story you are thrown into is vastly layered. Just when you think you've got to the bottom of things, someone else is revealed and makes you think again. Again. To cap it off, there are side quests galore. Some are just fun little distractions and others span the entire campaign and offer you rare and powerful items to reward you for your hard work. Perfect for the more hardcore player that has to unlock everything. Number 3. Final Fantasy 3. Now this is a masterclass of how to take the elements that work and remove the elements that don't work and create an experience that builds on all the positives. That's not to say that Square didn't try anything new here, but they came from refining the good. Take the job system, something that is now synonymous with Final Fantasy. It was truly born here. In the original game you selected a class and you were tied to it for the whole game. Now, this is very tricky for the first playthroughs as you have no idea as to what advantages and disadvantages they bring. You are unable to select classes that fit your playstyle and you have to adapt your playstyle to the classes you've chosen. But with three you can swap at will and by adding capacity points this limits how often this can be done giving it a nice balance. Another first in three is summons. Try to think of Final Fantasy without this and your brain will literally melt. They've always been inseparable, right? Wrong. It wasn't until 3 that they were first used and have been a mainstay ever since, often forming a core part of the storyline. Number 2, Final Fantasy 6. Wow. How compelling is this game? It feels like things have been put together with such precision and intent. Everything and everyone has a reason and an impact on the overall experience throughout. Having 14 playable characters sounds like a recipe for disaster. They're all going to be vying for centre stage and are all really bland as the developers fail to give them their own personality and reason for being there in the first place, right? Not at all. Every member of the party, not to mention the antagonists too, has a valid reason to be part of this story and add their own important element to it, making it feel very real. I mean, who doesn't love Kefka and that laugh? <laughs> that laugh. If 6 had been originally released on the PlayStation, receiving the advantages that a wider market and more powerful software would have given it, it is highly likely that this would be the game that is so highly praised and beloved by fans, and not 7. Speaking of which, number 1, Final Fantasy 7. It had to be, didn't it? For many, this was their first step into the Final Fantasy world, and few would argue that Square have ever managed to do it better. It was so different from anything that had come before, 
from 3D character models and much more detailed world to a non-medieval and more technological based environment and not forgetting that moment. You know the one. We all knew we were in for one hell of a ride when we opened up the case and saw three discs. Three discs? What kind of monster is this? Then this gets backed up by the instruction booklet advertising the memory card, claiming you'll never beat Final Fantasy without it. How true they were. Final Fantasy VII made JRPGs popular outside of Japan, and the brilliant thing is, this particular entry to the series is still popular today. After all, it's the only game that fans have been screaming for a remake of. They want to experience it with the gorgeous graphics, sound and cinematics that it deserves. Yes, we've had Before Crisis, Crisis Core, Dirge of Cerberus and Advent Children to help expand the Seven universe, but it's the original that people really want to experience again, and who can blame them? What do you make of my top fives? Please let me know in the comments below. Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. Please subscribe to the channel. I have been That British Guy and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.